I wanted to have a little fun with you, so I wanted to share a game um, uh, in this master class that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the pawn structure, but it does somewhat, and the effectiveness of the pieces. Uh, so I wanted to have a fun, fun game. And I, from my chess career, I got a game that I wanted to share. And I'm a, I am black, and uh, I have a philosophy in the opening. It, it's very, very simple. There's three principles for any opening, any defense. Don't make it complicated. In fact, quite the opposite you'll come to understand that I really appreciate the KISS principle. And what is the KISS principle? Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. You don't overcomplicate your life. Don't, get your, don't confuse yourself. So the three principles that you need to understand for any opening or any defense is very simple. You want your fair share of control of the center. That's it. You want second principle. You want to develop your pieces to effective squares. Third principle, you want a safe king. If you can achieve those three things in any opening or any defense, pat yourself on the back, you're doing good. You want your fair share of the center, imagining that your opponent is fighting for his fair share of the center. You want effective squares for your pieces, and you want a safe king. Take a look at this game. In the days that this game was played, I loved the perk defense, still do uh, as well. And at the perk, early in the perk, you're not really fighting uh, for your fair share of the center, you're fighting for effective piece development. So these are all standard moves, and I'm just about I'm just one step away from getting a safe king. And once I've achieved that, I'm then going to play the move e5. And I've got my fair share of the center, effective development, safe king. I'm doing good. When my opponent throws <laughs> a monkey wrench into my plans with the move g4, I was like, was taken aback by this move because the desirable and intended castles could easily uh, uh, fall victim to a pretty mm, scorching attack. Just you can imagine that the pawn is going to go here. My opponent will capture on g6 and zip, zap, kabam. I could get checkmated on the open H file. By the way, I wanted to mention that my opponent, Vlado Kovacevic, was famous for having beaten, defeated uh, Bobby Fischer, and that wasn't unknown to me um, that he had done that. So uh, I was very, let's say, respectful of my opponent's prowess, and he was going to kill me. Okay. So c7, c6. Uh, I'm taking a very flexible approach to uh, my opponent's um, aggressive play. And in my mind's eye, I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll grab some space on the queen side with the move b5, b4, kick my opponent's knight from c3, an effective square, and maybe drive my opponent's knight backwards. Also, I started thinking that I shouldn't commit my king early. My opponent has played g4. Let him continue with his plan, which he did. And guess what? Now I am definitely not castling. Well, okay, b5, h5. Now here, I was slightly concerned that my opponent actually might play the move h5, h6. And I want to keep the second principle. I want to keep effective, my, uh, effective squares for my pieces. So I played rook g8. So that in case my opponent played h6, my bishop would step back and I'd maintain the control of 
the long diagonal. My opponent captured. Hg h3. Now notice that what my opponent has done is not bad. Uh, for those of us who uh, like this concept of space, space control, the rook on h1 suddenly controls four squares in my camp. The, the rook is more powerful than it had been at the very start of the game. Knight f3, b4, knight back, a5. Okay, so the way I play chess and the way I think about the pieces and the strategy in the pawn skeleton, well, as you know, I've just kicked this knight back to what I call the barracks. So at the start of the game, all of our pieces and pawns are in their barracks and they're waiting to be deployed. And I've kicked my opponent's piece uh, backwards and he's lost time. I, my pawn on b4 now controls more space. And I look at my opponent's light square bishop, the bishop on e2, and I compare it to my bishop on c8, and I say, that bishop on e2 is better than my bishop on c8. I should be looking for an opportunity to play bishop a6. I'm trading off a bishop that controls two of my squares, and my bishop doesn't control any of my opponent's squares. My opponent played the move a4 because he didn't want to see uh, a line of play where I would play c5, potentially opening up this diagonal and play a4, potentially a3. C5. Um, once again, I want to play uh, for control of the center. And the move C5, I look and I say, this pawn on D4 attacks two of my squares. Let me get rid of it for the pawn on C6. My opponent played D5. Knight B6. C4. So effectively stopping my plan of playing bishop on c8 to a6 to uh, attack the c4 pawn. King d7. Um, explain to me as best you can why did I play the move king on e8 to d7. What on earth was I thinking when I played the move king d7? Was it a mouse slip? <laughs> Not bad. Baboos, to play rook h8 to connect your queen and the rook, to run your king to c7. The queen side is locked up. It will be safe. Lock position. King is safe behind the pawn chains. Absolutely. You guys are, uh, you, you're, you're nailing it. The dad bod, the dad bod shuffle. That's, uh, walk, <laughs> king walks away. Precisely. Okay. Once again, in the opening, we're trying to get our fair share of the center. Effective uh, squares for our pieces, safe king. In my mind's eye, this queen side structure, a5, b4, c5, d6, is locked up. White structure, imagining also b3, d5, c4, a4, the queen side's all closed. Knight b8 to d2. I can challenge for the 
h file with the move rook h8 i want to recapture on h8 with the queen and then i could infiltrate the h file rook g1 king c7 so i've achieved safety for my king rook b1 what do we understand about this move rook b1 well my opponent was a little bit worried that i might play the move bishop d7 as well as queen e8 so in order to defend this pawn on a4 he wants to play the move b3 hence he evacuates this diagonal now from the pawn structure um it was very very easy for me to concoct what i think is a very very obvious plan what's the most important file in the position what's the most important file in the position h file certainly and why is the h file the most important file because it's open the h file is open you want to control the open file with a rook or a major piece what's the most important diagonal in the position again we're looking at from from the black point of view you guys want to play uh, at the uh, black position. What's the most important diagonal in the position? A1, H8 diagonal. Bingo bongo. Brilliant. That's exactly right. The H8, A1 diagonal. Now, why does my watch keep falling off? Don't hate that. Right in the middle of an important chess lesson, too. Okay. So, The most important file is the H file. The most important diagonal is the long diagonal H8A1. Now that we know that, what would be the best square for the black queen in a position where the H file is the best file and the diagonal the long diagonal is the the best diagonal what's the best square for my queen h8 it's that simple h8 congratulations to all of you who got that answer right this move becomes obvious once you see once you understand that the h file and the long diagonal is what's happening then the move rook h3 followed by queen h8 my pieces are taking up effective squares the queen is very effective on h8 the rook on h3 is in white's camp i can go rook h1 i can go over um both sides have problems with their pieces. Look at my lousy pieces on A8 and B8 and C8. Those pieces have to come out of their barracks. They have to become effective. Just as White's queen on D1 is no great shakes, the bishop on C1 is not that great, the knight on D2, well, it's okay. It's not winning any... Um, prizes i've accomplished something with my rook and with my queen on h8 but i'm not proud of my knight on b8 so strategically i start thinking that the knight on f3 white's knight on f3 is better than my knight 
on b8 that I should play knight to d7, knight e5, and trade off my passive knight for my opponent's active knight. My grandmaster opponent is sitting there on the other side of the board saying, yuck, my bishop on c1 is doing no good. Uh, I've got to get, I've got to do something about that bishop, it's passive, whereas the bishop on g7 is active. Knight f1, knight d7, bishop f4, knight e5. And for me, we can understand what just happened. White got rid of his passive bishop on c1, showing great understanding. I got rid of my passive knight on b8, showing great understanding. Pat myself on the back for that one as well. And who got the better of the deal? Well, we're not 100% sure. But one thing's for sure is my queen on e5 is now really lording over the position. It's controlling a lot of space and attacking a pawn. Defending the pawn on, on f3. Okay, well this one's pretty obvious too. Bishop to d7, developing, uh, preparing to bring this rook, I don't know, into the game like something like so. Queen c2 by my opponent. And here, I must say, um, I was very proud with myself. I liked my position a lot. And yet at the same time, um, I wanted to play really a good um, plan. I wanted to now enact a really good plan. And it seemed to me that a very good plan would be to play rook <coughs> Excuse me, rook to a and rook here. Maybe try to force the trade of the rooks and then play queen takes g5. I thought that would be a really, really good plan. But I really like the idea very much. penetrating with my rook to the first rank. Or let me put it a different way. When my rook was with my rook on h3, it's in a sense x-raying the third rank. But if it was on the first rank, Ooh, then I would be pinning out my opponent's pieces. And so for me, this plan, or this move, I want to say, was obvious and very good. Rook, pardon me, uh, queen d4, attacking the rook, rook g2, rook h1. Now I'm making my piece, the rook, on h3, much more effective by putting the knight on f1 in an absolute pin. My rook on h3 was good, but could it be better? And in my mind's eye, that rook on h3 that has gone to h1 has improved uh, a lot. Rook f2. Now this was actually a very, very difficult choice that I had 
and I like the decision I made. I thought that the queen is very good on d4. But I was somewhat afraid that, in fact, my queen, which is so good on d4, my opponent cannot allow that queen on d4 to remain on d4. That my opponent should, should I, for example, play a move like rook h, pardon me, rook a8 to h8, that my opponent should try his best to uh, trade queens, okay? So I liked the power of my queen. I thought that my queen is more effective than my opponent's queen. Why did I think that? You tell me, why do I think my queen is better than my opponent's queen, and how can I avoid trading queens? You're deep in his space. I'm dominating his space. My centralized queen, more space, absolutely greater space, more scope of space. So, conversely, my opponent's queen controls none of my space, so I would want to avoid trading queens because my queen is more effective. My queen, and this is where it's very, very important about definitions, my queen's an attacking piece. My opponent's queen is a defensive piece. And always and always and always you'll hear chess grandmasters, chess coaches telling their students, avoid trading attacking pieces for defensive pieces. I played the move queen h8 in order to avoid queen b2. Even though I've given up uh, a great centralized square. Don't forget, I still control a lot of my opponent's territory. When in exactly in this position as black, I played the move queen h8, this is important. In, to my way of thinking, I attack eight of my opponent's squares. I attack d4, c3, b2, a1, but I also attack h4, h3, h2, h1. So I attack eight squares of my opponents. My opponent's queen attacks none of mine. So I'm looking to retain queens. f4, queen h4. Pretty much my opponent's last move was more or less forced. I was going to go queen g5 anyway, attacking the pawn. The pawn was going to need defense. Thus far, I've played very well. I'm very, very happy with my position. Uh, to my way of thinking, the rook on a8 is not effective. I could bring the rook to h8, and boy, do I have triple power on the h file. Very, very good but I would like to open up the position for my rook. I played the move f6. So I want to capture, and then after any recapture, well now I've opened up the f file and I'm ready to play rook f8. So my opponent stopped me from doing that. I recapture uh, munch munch. And now I have it in my mind that I want to play rook to e8 and bishop to, oops, f5. So let me play two bad moves for my opponent for just a moment so you can see what I was up to. And this is what I was up to. So in this position, 
This rook pins the bishop. This rook pins the knight. This queen pins the rook. So talk about it. effective pieces, right? Takes, takes. So that's my plan. Rook over to e8, bishop to f5. Maybe this bishop could even go to g4 and to h3. And if I was to say that all my pieces were effective, that's not true. My knight on b6 is actually not that effective, but it's not needed for the moment. I would like, uh, maybe I would go bishop g4, knight d7, and bring the knight into play. But right now, my major pieces are doing enough of, the, of a job uh, that I don't need my knight. E5. It's kind of our last hurrah. Again, my king is perfectly safe. My opponent's king, however, is not. And this <laughs> is what I wanted to ask you before I let the cat out of the bag a little while ago. What would have happened if my opponent had played bishop e2? Come on, you don't get too many, uh, too many tries on this one. Rook takes f1. There you go. Rook takes f1 would have been a, an absolute killer. As, uh, again, all of my, all of White's pieces, the knight on f1, the bishop on e2, the rook on f2 are all pinned. And a combination like rook takes f1 would be a, a scorching victory. And uh, I just wanted to say that this game, which I played like I was 20 years old, uh, was based on almost every single thing I have told you thus far in the two lessons and experience was I was thinking in terms of space, material, uh, putting my pieces on effective squares and everything. And you kind of see the fruition of my plan that was based on pawn structure and, the, and so on. Our third lesson, which is going to be coming up very shortly, we hope, as soon as we hit that 3,700 subscriber lesson, is going to be about the th uh, an, another element which we're going to call time or development. I hope you've enjoyed these two master classes. Tell your friends where you're hanging out, which is the Chess Bra channel. Tell them what's going on, that uh, they should support the channel, support what we're trying to do by subscribing or donating, buying some swag, supporting our sponsors. And <clears throat> I'll see you tomorrow for continuing coverage of the World Cup and uh, more, more master classes. Thank you so much for sharing your day. Bye.